This is the United Nations General Assembly. Every year, world leaders from over 190 countries meet together to discuss major global issues, talk face to face, and pass joint resolutions to solve global problems. Lasting up to nine days, it's one of the greatest tools for peace and unity in the world. We must do everything we can to close the gap between the world as it is and the world as it should be. That is the mission of the United Nations. And yet, it scares some Christians half to death. Why are some Christians scared at the thought of world peace and unity? Well, to understand that, we have to take a look at the world of eschatology, or the study of end times events, specifically biblical prophecy. We need to listen to the prophets. The biblical books of Daniel, John, Revelation, and others contain words of prophecy, which many Christians believe refer to the end of the world or the end times. Passages stoke fears that one day Christians around the world will be rounded up, tortured, and executed if they don't denounce their faith. The biblical book of Daniel in chapter 7 talks about a kingdom that will devour the whole earth. The book of Revelation prophesies that everyone will be marked. Apparently, world leaders will hand over their power to the beast, who will round up and exterminate Christians. The end times are supposed to be a time of great hardships, trials, and tremendous suffering with natural disasters, wars, and rumors of wars. And some Christians are terrified that the current peaceful unity we're experiencing is just a sign that all this bad stuff is about to happen. Well, Lucifer is communicating. His organizational structure is like a pyramid. And probably most of you are familiar with that eyeball in the pyramid in the back of your dollar bill. That's the all-seeing eye of Lucifer. That's Satan's eyeball. Now ask yourself a question. What is Satan's eyeball doing in the back of a dollar bill? They're terrified of a one world government or a new world order. The goal is to go into a new world order which is all in the Bible. The closeness to the Lord's return, all the prophetic signs are here. But over the last 2,000 years, there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of failed end times predictions. Jehovah's Witnesses claimed that the world would end in the 20th century, giving multiple false dates, including 1941, and when that failed, 1975. It's the end of the world! God loves you! He's gonna kill you! Televangelist Pat Robertson claimed it would end in 1982. And then again in 2007. And Christian radio broadcaster and evangelist Harold Camping made at least four false end of the world prophecies. In Matthew 24 verse 21, it says, And then there will be great tribulation such as this world has never known nor ever shall know. In other words, it's the end. The evidence in the Bible points to the fact that September 6th, of 1994 will be the last day of the final tribulation period. It is terrible, super terrible, and everyone will know it's Judgment Day. Detectives say the 47-year-old mom thought the world was coming to an end, and with recent events in Japan and the turmoil in the Middle East, Benedetto didn't want her daughters to go through it. So she took a box cutter and paring knife, slit her daughter's throats and wrists, then did the same thing to herself. You can see her wounds in her mugshot. But I'm wondering how you feel today about the, uh, your prediction. Well, I'm bewildered. I'm very bewildered, and that's all I can say right now. On May 21, there's going to be a terrific earthquake, way, way greater than anything that the Earth has ever experienced and that'll be the beginning of Judgment Day. There's just no reason in the world, no possibility that it will not happen. Before meeting his own end in 2013. Jesus himself claimed that he would return while some of his disciples were still alive, but also hedged by saying that no one, not even Jesus, knew the exact day or hour of his return, except for God. That's suspicious. That's weird. Add to this the fact that biblical end times visions usually describe scenes that even the most drugged up LSD junkie would raise an eyebrow or two at, and you start to understand why many Christians are reluctant to embrace them. They shy away from them in their sermons and often don't interpret them literally. Even my missionary parents who believed in faith healing, speaking in tongues, and the resurrection of the dead, angels and demons, and a 6,000 year old earth rarely talked about the book of Revelation. And when they did, they were careful to say that much of it might be symbolic and warned against literal interpretations. Even for my parents, self proclaimed in times prophets like Carol Camping and Bible code nuts like Perry Stone were a little too much. But that said, there is one factor about the end times that most Christians seem to agree on. 
the belief that the closer that we get to the end times, the more that Christians will face persecution. The enemy is after you to shoot a flaming dart in your life. Today, we're going to talk about the arrows of the enemy. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Bible verses warn that there will be wars and rumors of wars, that people will hate Christians because of Christ. Christians were encouraged in the Bible to embrace persecution because it was a sign that they were doing something right, and we're told they would receive blessings in heaven for their persecution on earth. I must say that we have some very lovely prizes for you. Star Kiss, the good tasting tuna packed to natural spring water. And yet, with a few notable exceptions, namely China, Communist Russia, and the Muslim world, ever since the conversion of Constantine, the persecution of Christians has been predominantly by other Christians, especially in Australia, Western Europe, and the Americas where Christianity holds a tremendous amount of power and influence. After all, Christianity is the largest religion on earth and Christians make up a third of the world's population. Over half of all countries on earth are majority Christian and in 41 countries, Christianity is either the official state religion or is officially favored and receives preferential treatment, which runs contrary to the Christian global persecution narrative. With a few notable setbacks, freedom has continued to improve around the world for for hundreds of years now. Violence has steadily declined, and even with two world wars and the technology to kill at scale, significantly fewer people per capita died violently in the last hundred years than has been the case in almost any other time in human history. Once almost universally utilized, torture now has been widely denounced. Women, children, gays, and minorities have more rights than ever in history. Cooperative policies and international trade have brought the world closer together, and crimes against humanity are met with international intervention. Sure, there is still a ton of progress to be made and peace can be precarious, but still, we are, without question, living in the most peaceful time in human history. That's not wishful thinking or Pollyanna optimism. That's scientific, data-based, hard, evidential, demonstrable fact. In the book Better Angels of Our Nature, Harvard psychologist Steven Pinker lays out a bulletproof case showing the data behind this claim. The papers could have run the headline, 137,000 people escaped from extreme poverty yesterday, every day for the last 25 years. That's one and a quarter billion people leaving poverty behind, but you never read about it. And the book Abundance by Peter Diamandis shows how exponential technological progress is rapidly leading to a post-scarcity world of abundance. The cell phone in your pocket is literally a million times cheaper and a thousand times faster than a supercomputer of the 70s. And if this technological boom is leveraged properly, famine, poverty, illiteracy, and scarcity could quickly become a thing of the past. If you want a quick summary of either of their books, I'll link to both of their TED Talks below. So how do Christians square this circle? How do they simultaneously weigh the reality that things are getting better while clinging to the biblical belief that everything is going to be just terrible and the world is sinful, fallen, and only getting worse? It's hopeless. That religious freedoms will be stripped away from them and persecution is unavoidable. We're done for. Well. In many cases, they straight up don't accept it. When I presented this data to my dad, he literally told me that it was wrong and he didn't believe it. It clashed with his Christian beliefs, with the fear mongering that pastors so eagerly preach in weekly Sunday sermons. Why would God say so much about the time we're living in? It's gonna be the worst time in human history. Oh, you could not be more wrong. We see what's happening in the world today. Jesus said pestilences, and earthquakes and famines, that's just the birth pangs. Today, famine has been banished to the most remote and war-ravaged regions. That's not the birth yet. And so now what we're seeing right now is intensifying when women have babies. Yes. They begin to have birth pangs, but they get closer together and more severe. What we're seeing right now, since Israel became a nation in 1948, which actually started the end time clock, we've seen an intensity in birth pangs. And so today's world, I've never seen anything like this COVID-19 thing. Bro. Clearly you've never heard of the bubonic plague, the plague of Justinian, the Spanish flu that killed 50 million people, that's more than World War I, or heard that we found smallpox pustules on 3,000 year old mummies. Pandemics are not even remotely new. The only thing that's new is our ability to scientifically sequence the virus's genome and rapidly make a vaccine at scale for it. I've never seen what's happening in the world right now, the unrest, the famines, pestilences, killer hornets. Killer hornets. You add to that the media's negativity bias, the fact that fear sells. So news companies are 10 times more likely to broadcast negative stories, even if they're a thousand times as rare as positive ones. Tonight, the moon has exploded. You begin to see how after over 60 years of living in a bubble of negative stories, it's so 
easy to view the world with apocalyptic glasses. It goes in steps. First, you demonize Christians. We're on the top of the list. You know what that means? In a time of crisis, they come after us first. And you all know what happens in Nazi Germany, where it led concentration camps and so on and so forth. The Bible teaches that the satanic system will find its final expression in the kingdom and the person of the Antichrist. You won't be going to any weddings, but you'll be going to about 30 funerals a day. There will be human, there will not be enough room to bury 4 billion human bodies or more. Stop it. Get some help. Even if you don't suffer from crippling anxiety, it shapes your worldview. And that's not even mentioning the fact that baby boomers grew up during the Cold War with the constant threat of nuclear annihilation stoking their fears of the outside world. But the Cold War ended peacefully. Still, couple that with the belief that God rewards persecution with heavenly rewards. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. It's got half the calories of tuna and oil. And there's almost an eagerness for this bleak perspective of the world to be true. Christians are encouraged to pick up their cross and follow Christ even to their deaths. They're taught stories of great missionaries and martyrs who are depicted as heroes whose examples should be emulated. Because Jesus literally said to embrace persecution and rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. I grew up as an evangelical missionary kid, and songs like I'm Not Ashamed by the Newsboys and Jesus Freak by DC Talk encouraged me and other Christians to be loud and proud about our faith, even if it resulted in persecution. Despite how cheesy both of these albums were, both bands are multi platinum, selling millions of albums, and we're both part of a larger narrative that persecution was just a sign that we're doing something right. We were taught to anticipate it, almost crave it, and at the very least, not shy away from it. And now, I want to make it abundantly clear that I'm not saying that religious persecution doesn't exist. It absolutely does. And as a Christian who spent 15 years of my life in the Muslim world, I heard about it and saw it firsthand. But just as majority Sunni Muslims living in Saudi Arabia aren't likely to be persecuted persecuted for their Muslim faith, Christians living in majority Christian countries aren't likely to face much persecution either. Christians, I don't agree with your beliefs. I think the Bible sows confusion and discord and is dead wrong about science, history, and basic morality while claiming divine inspiration. But I will fight to my dying breath for your freedom to believe in it, even if you're wrong. By the same metric, I think the Quran is barbaric backwards and the source of tremendous suffering and oppression. But I wholeheartedly denounce the imprisonment of over a million Uyghur Muslims in Chinese concentration camps, and I advocate for their freedom. Because despite the Bible and the Quran outright right denouncing freedom of religion and freedom of speech and advocating for partial treatment for their adherents and even non-democratic theocracies, without the basic enlightenment values of free speech, free press, and freedom of religion, we wouldn't even be able to freely have a discussion about which beliefs hold water. And without being able to freely scrutinize ideas and claims, how else are we going to be able to discover what's actually true? Most atheists you'll talk to and every humanist you talk to will similarly support your religion religious freedom. They just don't want your views forced on them. Religious freedom, not religious privilege. But living in a free, hyper-religious country with a church on every street corner, religious billboards, and evangelical pastors advising the president, most Christians in America don't know what persecution looks like. If public taxpayer-funded schools are required to remain neutral on religion and not teach the teachers religion as fact, pastors freak out and call it persecution. A fight for faith in Louisiana as a principle criticized by atheists for promoting religion. If public court buildings aren't allowed to play favoritism to Christianity and are required to either have no religious symbols or welcome all religions to the playing field, they melt like frickin' snowflakes, get worked into a tizzy, and scream that the government is coming for their Bibles and forcing other religions on them. They regularly hold See You at the Poll events in public schools where kids gather outside of class around a flagpole for prayer and worship, but will lose their mind when a picture emerges that looks like kids might be praying the Muslim namaz or salah. Even when in actuality, this is a picture of a tornado drill. If this was a Muslim prayer, half of them wouldn't be facing their ass towards Mecca. See, they don't want religious equality, they want religious 
privilege, even if it's to the detriment of the religious freedoms of everyone else who doesn't share their beliefs. But Jesus didn't say that things would get easier. He said Christians would be mocked and persecuted for their faith. And because the persecution of Christians is either so rare or so mild in most majority Christian countries, then in order to relate to Jesus' prophecies, they have to interpret religious neutrality or equality as a personal attack on them and their religious beliefs. Do you realize that Starbucks wanted to take Christ and Christmas off of their brand new cups? That's why they're just plain red. No more Merry Christmas on Starbucks. No more. I wouldn't buy. Hey, look, I'm speaking against myself. I have one of the most successful Starbucks in Trump Tower. Maybe we should boycott Starbucks, I don't know. As a hardcore religious kid, I had several friends who were atheists who would hang out at my church's youth group because they enjoyed the social atmosphere. I had a Buddhist friend and dozens of Muslim friends, and the weird thing is, none of them made fun of my Christian beliefs. They accepted them and were super respectful about it, but just didn't really bring it up. I did, however, get made fun of by other Christians for being an over-the-top super Christian. The closest thing to religious suppression most Christians are ever going to get is either a raised eyebrow or a little ridicule, usually from other less extreme Christians. Left with persecution blue balls, they have to resort to virtue signaling to demonstrate how much they really love Jesus. That's why my last video showcased Christian kids on TikTok acting out their willingness to die for Jesus, an extremely unlikely to come to fruition fantasy. It's a hard pill to swallow for many of them because they want the heavenly reward they believe persecution brings, and Jesus warned that the world would hate and persecute them. But as my roommate says at the end of every episode of the Atheist Call-In Show Talk He Then, we don't hate you. We just think you're wrong. We don't, don't hate you. you. We just think, think you're wrong. wrong. Last month, I said whoever followed me on Twitter and tweeted out my video on the science of ghost sightings would be entered into a randomly selected book raffle. And I'm pleased to announce that Joni at Flutter Monkey is this month's winner. Congratulations! <laughs> I'll be reaching out to you for an address to send it to, so make sure that you check your inbox for that. And this month's monthly book drawing, proudly sponsored by Anthony Guthrie, is for the book The Believing Brain by Michael Shermer. It's about how people construct beliefs, even about really wacky stuff, and reinforce them as truths. I'll include a personal note from me in the book and sign it. So to enter for a chance to win, simply follow me on Twitter and share out this video with the hashtag Christians Have It Easy. If you appreciated this video and you want to help me make more like it, you can support my work with an ongoing pledge on patreon.com slash holykoolaid or with a one-time donation on PayPal. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. And as always, dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid. Goodbye, stupid earth! That appears to be some delay! Huh?